get this trigger stick and this piece will come down. I gotta get this stick higher, more weight out here. Well, I just found something promising here. Flip it around and show you. It's good stuff. So, these little droppings. In there. Alright there. We just found a toilet. A muskrat. Pick you guys out. Yeah, set the camera back up. Another piece. Need four of those. I want to get these good and smooth, get all these birds off. There'll be two stuck in the ground like EA, two on the other side. So, this piece here, that's what the fall will fall down onto, trapped in between it. We'll add weight. But before these sticks, pound it in between like EA. Two more on this side. There'll be one stick across the top. But we'll just build it and show you. I'm gonna keep chopping away here. Always want to set on sign. Increase your odds the best you can. So something else this trap needs is cordage. Here's some more of that cattail. I do have some 550 cord with me, but if I didn't, I can always take this cattail. And it works better, I think, when it's green and when it's dry like this, you best to wet it. You just do a reverse twist. Keep twisting away from yourself till it folds over. Then you pinch it, twist away, pull it back, way pull it back. Way pull it back. Way pull it back. And you could actually make your own cordage fairly easy out here. The right plants. Cattail doesn't make real strong cordage, but for this trap, for a small animal, it would definitely be sufficient. Just keep laying more into it. That would, wouldn't take you too long. You'd have you some cordage. So you just twist away, pull back, away, pull back. And what you get? Nice rope. Nice cordage. Hell, I guess. Why don't we just go ahead and make make the rope for this? 
Get something to do. We're just wasting the day anyway, aren't we? I don't have nowhere to be. It's right here next to this little drainage. Waiting on them fishermen to get out of the hole. It's pretty brittle, but if you got this wet first, it helps if you kind of crunch it up. My grandfather was an outfitter here in the Idaho mountains. He was my hero. Kind of hearted man. Great with stock. Don't get me wrong, he had a mean streak. He liked to like to fight some in his younger days. I've heard stories. He was a outfitter and a, a logger. And uh, his nickname was the Badger. He wasn't a very big man. He had a huge heart though. Anyway, I guess where I'm going with that is he was a huge influence on my life. Uh, I didn't like staying home a whole hell of a lot around my parents. They weren't real good together. They ended up divorcing when I was about, I think I was 12. My granddad, he was retired, so I, I'd go spend the summers up in Elk City with him. He still had horses and mules. And we'd go out in the Idaho backcountry. He'd take me around fishing these backcountry lakes. And, and uh, just had a great childhood running around up there with my grandparents. My mom and dad would darn near like to kill one another. <laughs> but it wasn't funny. Uh, I found that's the way I cope with things. Just smile and laugh. You know, life's too short to be upset. Everything in my childhood brought me to where I am today. I got a beautiful wife and two sons. And uh, I wouldn't trade where I'm at with my family for nothing. Oh, well, Wyatt be my youngest and Wayne's my oldest. So my grandpa's name was Wayne. And when I was 14, I shot a buck with him. And uh, I told him that day, if I ever had a son, my first born son, I was going to name after him. And uh, I did, but... My wife, she didn't like the name Wayne, and boy, it was a tough go. My grandpa was still alive, so I kept my foot down. I wasn't going to break my pr promise to that old man, and uh, after Wayne was born, went up to Elk City, up to their house. My old grandpa, he asked what his name was, and I said Wayne, and boy, the smile on his face, the way he lit up. It was a, I guess that's just a little story where my son got his name after my granddad. I say he's my hero. He's a packer and a guide and he's an outfitter. Him and his brother, my uncle, great uncle Don, own Nitz Brothers Outfitting. And uh, I've actually got my uncle Don's saddle still. I don't have a horse no more. I've been three years without one now. Maybe four. I think this spring... I'm going to get me another horse. I don't know if it's going to be strong enough to use or not. Pretty brittle. Like I said, it's pretty small trap, so I won't have to hold up a whole heck of a lot of weight, but it's got to hold some weight. Well, just in that matter of time, I'm telling you that story, that's what we've got so far. Let's see if this is green would be better a little more pliable not as brittle uh, nothing's growing yet it's spring early spring we got a uh, late winters here in idaho and i'm pretty low elevation right now i'm normally up in the mountains up in the snow that's where i like to be i spent five years in the navy I always miss the trees. I was in Southern California 
for half of it and then up in Woodby Island with an EOD unit and uh, my plan I joined at 17 years old I was the youngest sailor in the year 2000 or youngest CB and uh, my intention was doing 20 years getting my retirement coming home and buying my granddad's old outfit out and following in his footsteps and it's kind of funny my grandpa he asked me so what do you want to be when you grow up and I said well I want to be a hunting guide and a packer my grandpa he says well there ain't no money in it I said, well how come you done it all them years and he told me it's always stuck with me so there's two ways to be rich in this world you either go to work for somebody bust your butt and uh, save all the money you make and be rich the traditional way or you spend your life doing what you want to do be rich in happiness and uh you know we only get one shot at this life so that really sunk in oh i decided that i'd try spending my life doing what i wanted to do be happy i've had a pretty good go of it so far um i've definitely done a lot of work traditional work um, in the Navy, I was a diesel mechanic for the CBs, called construction mechanic. I worked on heavy equipment. And when I got out, I worked on old logging trucks. Well, the first job I had, actually, I was still on uh, leave when I come home. It was separation leave. And uh, so I was still drawing a paycheck from the Navy. And there's a plumbing outfit just below where my mom lives there and I went and asked them if they were hiring and uh, I'll be thinking if they weren't so I gave go up being a plumber for a little bit and the pay was really good and we we're doing mainly new construction of man you guys make great money and this isn't bad well plumbing's a funny thing I got my first service call and I was running a snake down this plumbing. That gummer bound up and flicked. And flicked a piece of poo right here on my lip. And poo's gross. This gross. And it wasn't my poo. And I knew right then and there, right that moment, I was not cut out to be a plumber. So across the street, an old man named Bill, he was a, a logger, but he ran equipment old logging equipment so i walked across the street i i quit that job i hate i don't like to quit anything but i was not going to get poo flipped on my lip again and uh anyway i walked across the street and i'll be darn old bill didn't hire me and when i was a kid he used to always ride by his shop on a bicycle and growing up that road was a still a gravel road and small town <laughs> I used to go by his shop all the time. He always had these little hot candies, fireballs. They're called fireballs. I'd go down there and he'd air up my tire on my bicycle and give me a one of them fireball candies. Well, anyway, he hired me. I worked for him for two, three years, I guess, working on old logging equipment, mechanic. And, and then I uh, went to work with my dad down in a boat and outfit. That ran the Hell's Canyon, it's the deepest river gorge in North America. And uh, they ran great big old Yanmar diesels in these tour boats. And they did uh, fishing trips too. So I went to work down there with my dad working in a shop. And I liked it. And then the economy took a digger. Must have been in 08. So I ended up taking a job care keeping Sheep Creek up in the Hell's Canyon and uh, that was really good for me because I was going through some depression after getting hurt and uh, just I didn't feel like I fulfilled what I set out to do and um, anyway spent a lot of time spent three seasons up in the Hell's Canyon 15 miles away from the nearest road and uh, 
no power, no electricity. Had a little outhouse out back, and beautiful little creek ran through the yard. And the yard is two great big old sections, about the size of a football field, both of them, uh, well each. I had a push mower. My job was to flood that yard and to mow that big gummer, keep it nice and respectable. So these tour boats that would come through and the rafters and stuff, they'd go up there and picnic and whatnot. And I had a lot of time myself up there to reflect on things and try figuring out what I was going to do with my life. And I kept wanting to still pack and guide, you know, I didn't come out and do that. And like my original plan. So I got a hold of a kid I knew when I come out of the canyon. So I'd show up in the canyon in April and I'd come out up the end of August. I got a hold of a guy I knew that was a guide. I said, hey, you know, I really wanna, really wanna pack. And he um, said, well, you got any experience? I said, well, yeah, a little bit. You know, I grew up horses and mules, my grandpa riding in the back country and what have you, but I never officially packed. So anyway, old Tyler, he said, well, go down and work with my mom down in McCall, Idaho. She ran a outfit doing dude rides. So you get up early in the morning, get the stock ready, and uh, you have to brush them out, feed them, brush them out, get the saddles out, saddle them up get you a little breakfast and uh, then you take clients out on rides to do hour rides uh, half day rides full day rides and a dinner ride so I ride, rode their horses we'd always get stuck riding the colts you know the clients got the good horses and uh, that was a really fun job but then in the fall so at this time I'm working in McCall through the summers and we go up in the wilderness here in Idaho, go out clear trail, cross cut, and uh, start setting spike camps and base camp, and hauling all the gear. And it must be about September 15th, backcountry elk season to start. So I did that for, gosh, I don't know, seven years or something. That was about the time my son was born when I started doing that. So I started packing and guiding and talking to Tyler. I said, gosh dang, I don't want to go back to a normal job. You know, I wish this went year round. He mentioned, well, what about trapping? And I was always interested in trapping, so uh, got looking into it, got goofing around, wasn't catching nothing. An old man I used to shoot archery with uh, doing winter league competitions. I knew he was a trapper, so I went and pecked Howard's ear and uh said, Howard, I want to learn how to trap. Well, come on. He took me on his line. I trapped with him for two seasons. And he showed me the ropes. And he showed me the ropes. And uh, that was all real good. Learned how to catch coyotes for ranchers that were having trouble and, and what have you. And so then I'd trap in the winter and go pack and guide in the fall. And, and uh, through the summer, I rode horses all summer, taking people on these dude rides. And I just haven't looked back since. You know, I love riding horses, love being in the mountains. Uh, it's just good medicine. So, speaking of good medicine, we need to fix it, finish this trap up. So, this stick here could be underneath this, like this. This will be held up. I might have to cut one more longer stake here. Um, I got a notch cut. Look at that. Right there. I guess I'll just tie it up and I'll show you what we're going to do.
be able to get that maybe. Cut that too short. Now, if you guys get you a good woman in your life, they're treat her right, you know. And I can't believe what my wife puts herself through to help make sure kids are fed and clothed and. Take this big log here, add some weight to it. Just a little rock. Prop that up just a little bit. Oh, so you think it'll fire? What happens? We'll block it in. They'll come in here and hit this trigger stick. I'm gonna have to add a little more weight. Let me grab some more weight here. See if we can get that to fire a little harder than that. It's got to come down hard and fast. Get more weight on this. Now we'll come through here. I gotta do some adjustments. So hit this trigger stick. And this piece will come down. I gotta get this stick higher. More weight out here. I'll do a little fine tuning on it and I'll show you guys what we come up with there. I think we got it rigged up. Um, the final, before I leave, I'm going to throw a bunch of reeds and stuff over the top of this. So that if I catch something, the birds don't find it and get it. But um, I say, come through here. Caught my arm a little bit coming down, but he's pinched. I can't pull that out of there. So I got this all set up. I'll show you. So that's the least resistance is right up through the trap there. Nice clear path to the trigger. Everywhere else, pretty brushed in and blocked up. So 
I was able to build that trap with just an axe. Oh, you see, you've got a nice clear path. You're gonna see here, they're gonna be way under that stick, that won't bother them. And right through there. Didn't time that, I guess I should have. Um, I didn't want to put anything over the top, top here, right here, to feed that trigger stick at all. But uh, I got a friend showed up there wondering what I'm doing. Old mule. Hey, old mule. Hopefully they stay out of this. It's not big enough to hurt them at all. There is one more thing I need to do. So I found out here in Idaho, I can legally leave this set for muskrat as long as it's not any bigger than a 330, I believe is what it was. You can scale this up to take bear. Um, you, know, you can build as big as you want. Not legally, but if you're in a situation. Um, I got to go back to my pickup and grab a trap tag. I forgot to bring a tra trap tag with me. Be legal. It has to have my trapper ID number. I am a licensed trapper in the state of Idaho. And uh, been a licensed trapper in the state of Arizona as well. So anyway, flip you around and show you this one more time. I say it's all blocked in from this side. The clear path is through the trap. And that's our cattail line we made to the trigger stick down there to come over the top of that stick. And whammo. Maybe, just maybe, we'll get dinner. But anyway, I gotta walk over and get a trap tag. I'm gonna grab a couple because I'm gonna build a couple more traps. I think I'll build a scissor trap as well. I should be able to bait it with cattail root. So, anyway, thanks for watching.